Hi guys, uh, my name is Genevieve DeCurvor, and this year I have the lovely opportunity to work with Dr. Fernando Faunes in his laboratory at the University of Andres Bello in Viña del Mar, studying the role and regulation of the genetic pathway LIN28 and LET7 during Xenophis metamorphosis. Um, so I have a background of I studied at uh, Bowdoin College, I just graduated in May, and I studied uh, biology and also Hispanic studies, where I learned Spanish. And um, I, during my time at Bowdoin, I uh, had multiple independent studies, uh, studying, specializing in developmental biology, uh, working with uh, Dr. William Jackman in his laboratory, studying uh, zebrafish tooth development, the genetic regulation of tooth development, and so now I have the opportunity to change model organisms and to learn about a new species and, um, and, and humans and, and use it as a model organism to study uh, human ge genetic uh, and regulation of developmental transitions. Very exciting. And so developmental biology is the study of the molecular, cellular, um, and uh, physiological changes that lead from the one cell stage of a fertilized egg to an adult organism. And uh, it involves, uh, animal development specifically involves many spatial and temporal uh, changes. Uh, and there's lots of, there's been a lot of uh, studies that, and genes that are known to be involved in the spatial regulation of developmental transitions, but there's a lot less information known about the timing of developmental transitions. And timing is extremely important during development because it's uh, uh, a lot of rapid changes in tissues in a really short amount of time. And so it's crazy to think about how organisms are are timing these when to have puberty, for example, or or when to metamorphosize into a butterfly, and how how does that happen on a on a genetic level and on a molecular level? And so, and so, what are different types of developmental transitions? Um, uh, one of them that's most studied is the shedding of the cuticle of worm larvae, <clears throat> and many of the important developmental biology studies with spatial patterning and the genetic regulation of developmental transitions come from uh, using worm as a, a model organism and the metamorphosis of insects and amphibians like frogs, which I'll be studying. But it's also important to remember that uh, mammals go through developmental transitions, one of which is the pre to postnatal transition during birth, and the other is <clears throat> puberty, which uh, is similar to metamorphosis in many ways as it um, involves the, the use of hormones to, for regulation of, transi for, of the transition to sexual maturity. And so, let's see this video, I don't know if you can click to it, this is a, a video here, uh, cannot play media, darn, I thought that would happen. That's a cool video showing the, <coughs> showing exactly what this picture is showing, so it's okay, it's the same thing, but it's a really a beautiful video. Um, and so uh, metamorphosis is, uh, involves, of frogs, involves many uh, physiological changes, such as the reabsorption of the tail and the uh, growth of limbs. Um, And, it, and a metamorphosis uh, is uh, regulated by hormones, and so the, the scale, the NF scale, stages of uh, metamorphosis are actually uh, based on the, the level of thyroid hormones that are circulating throughout the body. And so during this uh, pre-metamorphosis stage, there are, there are no thyroid hormones in the uh, frogs, but during pro-metamorphosis, uh, there's the, an increase of thyroid hormone levels in the body, and at the climax of metamorphosis, uh, there's a peak of thyroid hormones, and then they slowly um, decrease. And uh, this process takes around eight to 10 days. And uh, metamorphosis of frogs is mainly, uh, and metamorphosis in general is mainly uh, regulated by the uh, a hormone axis called the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid gland axis, 
Um, and the hypo to really simplify a, 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 a large, uh, uh, a lot of different steps of the axes, the hypothalamus, which is located in your brain, uh, stimulates your, the pituitary gland, which is located right underneath it, to produce a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. And thyroid stimulating hormone uh, induces the thyroid gland, which is located in your neck, to produce two hormones. Thy uh, thyroid hormone 4, which is the most abundant, and uh, th a little bit of thyroid hormone 3, which is a, a, a more active form of the hormone. And these hormones are transported through the blood through an important uh, protein called uh, serum albumin, which I'll be studying. Uh, and they're, they're in target uh, tissues. The, the less active form, thyroid hormone 4, is, uh, is changed and turned into uh, thyroid hormone 3. And then this hormone uh, binds to specific receptors in target genes. And, and causes the transcription or the trans yeah tra causes transcript changes transcription of target genes that are involved in the axis so it it regulates itself and and so uh, so how are developmental transitions regulated and this is a, a a really large question and the question that I'll be trying to answer uh, a little bit. <laughs> this year in, in what Dr. Faunus' lab studies, because regulation of transition, uh, developmental transitions involves uh, sort of a synthesis of uh, many different things, of hormones, the release of hormones and the regulation of hormones and these hormonal axes. But these are, are induced by different genetic programs, uh, which have been studied in worm larvae. And so how are, how are these genes uh, causing different timing events and how are they influencing hormonal changes, but also the environment, like nutrient levels and density and how many organisms are in one place. All of these things also influence the timing of our developmental transitions. So it's a really complex thing to study. Really exciting. And so in C. elegans, there was a really important discovery in 1984 of a, a family of genes that are called heterochronic genes. And these heterochronic genes uh, have been, are now known to regulate the timing of developmental transitions. And so the, the two genes uh, that are the most studied are LIN28 uh, and LET7. And these genes are highly conserved in animal species, um, and they regulate the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells. So they're, LIN28 is highly expressed in, in um, embryonic stem cells, and, uh, and it's also expressed in, for example, tumors, because it's, they're replicating a lot, and so it's a really important gene to study for cancer research, for um, thyroid uh, uh, disorders, to understand puberty, to understand metamorphosis. It has a large range of, of importance. And so LIN28, it's an RNA, there have been two uh, versions of the genes in, in vertebrates, LIN28A and LIN28B, and it's a master regulator of gene expression. So based on different parts of the protein, it can regulate gene expression at different levels. And so it, it's an RNA binding protein, so it, it binds to RNA and, and changes its regulation or, or tells different uh, molecules to bind to change something. And so some of its things it does. It inhibits the biogenesis of the other heterochronic gene, LET7, through its uh, specific cold shock domain and its uh, two zinc finger domains, and which I've labeled in blue. So that's one function. It also can regulate the translation of genes. It's been known to uh, bind to using its, uh, cold, uh, using its C terminal domain, which is uh, in green. It uh, can bind to, to mRNA molecules, and it, it, uh, there's an interaction between RNA helicase A and, and LIN28 to, to induce trans, translation of genes. But it's also been shown to, it can downregulate the translation of genes as well, so it has multiple functions. And it's even been shown to influence, uh, to change gene expression at the transcriptional level by uh, 
inviting uh, by pulling in uh, DNA demethylases. So it does different things on different functions. And so this, this leads to the, the work of uh, Dr. Faunas in his lab, which we're able to, using, uh, able to show that the overexpression of LIN28 uh, delays metamorphosis in frogs, and so this, this uh, figure, I'll start by showing the, the frogs themselves, or actually, so that he used a, a heat shock promoter, so the, the, the promote, there's the, the LIN28 chain, and this promoter that when you put the frogs in uh, water for 30 minutes that's heated up, it overexpresses the gene, and so during these experiments for three weeks, three times a week, for 30 minutes, the frogs are induced to overexpress LIN28, and by doing so, it delayed metamorphosis by one month uh, compared to control well, the control frogs. So you can see that they're still in the larva stage, and the control frogs have their, they've completed metamorphosis and have their, their legs and their tails reabsorbed. And so this, um, these experiments are really important because it's showing that LIN28 uh, disrupts the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid gland access in some way. And so um, Dr. Founders in his lab want to understand how LIN28 is regulating metamorphosis. And so uh, another experiment that they did, they did proteomic and transcriptomic uh, analysis of the limbs and tail and to see how LIN28 is influencing the, the translation of important genes involved in uh, metamorphosis, and they found that the most down-regulated gene uh, was albumin. And albumin, like I said before, is the, the protein that transport thyroid hormones throughout the body, and so because the thyroid hormones are so important for metamorphosis, the, the fact that when you overexpress LIN28 and you don't have any more albumin to transport the body might, might lead to understanding how LIN28 is specifically affecting uh, metamorphosis in affecting this thyroid hormone axis. And so this experiment led to uh, the new research that's being done, which is specifically studying uh, LIN28 overexpression rather than in the entire frog, specifically how it's affecting the liver, because albumin is synthesized in the liver. And they showed that overexpression of LIN28 protein uh, uh, down again, down regulated uh, albumin. So there's uh, much less albumin in the in the body, and again, it fully delayed metamorphosis. In this. So this led to more specifically looking at how LIN28 is regulating um, gene expression and, and how it's affecting metamorphosis by um, some experiments that are that were done that cut out the, the C-terminal domain, which is the part that's regulating expression by uh, inviting RNA helicase to come and then causing the expression of genes. So now uh, these, these new, uh, trend, uh, these, this new line of frogs don't have the C-terminal domain, and so this removes the possibility that they're changing expression of genes based on um, through this pathway. And so it's looking specifically if LIN28 is, is going through the inhibition of LET7, and if LET7 is all, then down-regulating certain genes, like albumin, potentially. And so this is what I'll specifically be studying this year. It's the, the next step of Dr. Faunus's research. Um, and so specifically during... It, what doc, the last thing that Dr. Faunus has found is that the overexpression of both the truncated form of LIN28 and the full version of LIN28 both uh, delay metamorphosis by one month in an equal way. And so the research that I'll be doing, I'm asking two questions. How is the overexpression of the truncated form of LIN28, um, if that is also going to downregulate albumin in the liver? Or, and also, if the overexpression of the the full version of LIN28 and the truncated version of LIN28 are down-regulating LET7 in the same way in the liver. And so these questions are, are two small questions in this big idea of how is metamorphosis occurring and how are genes 
interacting with hormonal axes and the environment to cause metamorphosis to occur. This is what I'll be doing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Four minutes for questions. Take a crack at it. Yeah. Um, I, might, I might have uh, missed you saying this, but were you able to overexpress the gene just by changing the temperature of the water with the province? Yeah. So if I go so. back, it's all oversimplified here to, to a little more. Oh, did I do this? Can we go forward. Can you move it? Or not? Can I? To the to founders here. So this is the trend. Uh, the sort of layout of how the gene is being changed inside of the frogs. And so what it has is it has two different promoters. It has a, a beta crystalline promoter attached to GFP. And so if the frogs actually do have the trans gene in them with the heat shock promoter, they'll have bright green eyes. And so then you know, okay, they have bright green eyes, so the frogs also are overexpressing LIN28. When this, what the heat shock promoter does is when you put the frogs in the water, the heat shock promoter is induced, and so inducing the heat shock promoter causes the overexpression of the gene. It's sort of magical, but yes. When you put them in water, all you have to do is stick them in hot water at 34 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And so that's every time there's a little red. <laughs> and every time you're kind of heating the frog up. Can we see this? But every time you do that, you're overexpressing the genes. But it's not enough to hurt them, it's just they're taking a warm bath. <laughs> so metamorphosis is governed by T3 and T4. Right? Yeah, primarily. 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 I, and that's what they know. That you are basically said like puberty, right? Yeah. And so are the different hormones? No, I, I, it's unclear still, but it, the frogs are 80% similar. They have a, these frogs have up to 80% similarity to human genes, and so using frogs and studying metamorphosis is a model of studying, studying puberty, and so, uh, yes, this is a so way of... Does LIN28 affect estrogen and testosterone then? Probably, yep. And LIN28, it's really crazy because LIN28 is a gene that, like, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of, like, uh, this indu induced pluripotency of stem cells in, in this sort of research. LIN28 is one of the genes that's um, necessary to induce plenty potency. Mm -hmm. And so it has a, like, a large range of reasons to study, possibly. I have a question, and this is coming more from like um, developmental stages of young kids, but we, we, we see in humans that there's different onset uh, puberty based on economic status, and, I'm, and they've hypothesized that this might be stress-induced. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, are you creating a stress situation? Um, so that putting them in hot water? Yeah, to induce Because mm -hmm. I know like, uh, as, as countries become more economically advanced, like puberty actually uh, gets old. The, the children who, when they're going through puberty, the age becomes older. I would assume that I, I know that this one thing is that like none of the frogs are dying during this process. They're just being put in like a slightly warmer water just to induce the. But one thing is that set, uh, stress influences uh, hormonal axes like like the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis, and so I'm always thinking about anxiety and stress and cortisol and all these things and how they're influencing the in human health and they have direct impacts because. They, they're feedback loops, and so in general, it's a super. This is a super interesting question. Like outside of this heat shock thing, but in general, how stress and how our environment and how hormone levels that are in our food, for example, how all these things are influencing human health is super interesting. <laughs> yeah. Question. So, I, well, and this makes me wonder about like again going back to the question of global warming and how does this. It, I, 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 this isn't really your research question, but it makes me wonder as as, well, as our temperatures rise, like is this mass like uh, pushing of uh, of uh, these sort of uh, metamorphoses in animals and how it's uh, I don't know I don't know, but I I would assume not. I would assume that this heat shock promoter is just it's just used as sort of it's any, like any scientific technique to just to see how LIN28 is overexpressed and to see how LIN28 
um, interact, how, what, 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 it's like a way of causing the overexpression of Lin-28 is there's a way of seeing how Lin-28 works normally during metamorphosis. Great, I'm sure we have more questions than we'll discuss during lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, one more round of applause.